Good afternoon, dear colleagues, friends, and guests, the friends of the Field Museum, the Armin Seminar, and anthropology, after all. Welcome to the Field Museum. My name is Sabina Zvicek. I'm a Marie Curie Global Fellow at the Field Museum, working together with Bill Parkinson in anthropology department. As, and as someone who resides and works in Chicago, I and the Field Museum acknowledge that we, we are guests on the traditional homelands of indigenous nations. Our respect and gratitude to the many native peoples who live here today, as well as their ancestors. So welcome to the Women in Science sponsored um, seminar, Armour Seminar today. And before I introduce our speaker, Barbara Horisch, a co-director of the Austrian Archaeological Institute in Vienna, Austria, allow me to just make a remark about the science and who does science. And for this inspiration, I took from Nichelle Nichols, and maybe you recall her from the Star Wars, or uh, she became a really important NASA ambassador to, to hire many women or, or people from underprivileged backgrounds. And she says, science is not a boy's game. It's not a girl's game. It's everyone's game. And with this uniting statement, I would like to introduce to you a person who did contribute, who is herself one of those who believe it's everyone's game and was an, played an important role as a woman in science in Austrian landscape and for archaeology and anthropology widely, who is Barbara Horesch. And she has obtained her PhD in 2005 at the, at the Free University in Berlin, after and during which she specialized in prehistoric archaeology of Southeast Europe and, and West Asia. And ever and she, ever since, she has researched on the questions of neolithization, knowledge transfer, communication networks, and has built important interdisciplinary collaborations out of Vienna after winning an ERC starting grant, so from European Research Council, and uh, in prestigious START grant in 2010 from the Austrian National Science Fund. And she has led many research teams and excavations in Turkey, Serbia, and, and Iran, and is a co-editor of the Journal of Archaeologica uh, Archaeolog uh, Australica, and has, is a co-editor of or editor of several book series. She is also a corresponding member of the Austrian Archaeologic uh, of Austrian Academy of Sciences and German Academy of Sciences. And most importantly, Barbara has been open to interdisciplinary collaboration. I am grateful for her to welcome me as into her team as a trained cultural anthropologist back in 2015, which is not a everyday occasion in Vienna where I, I was studying at the time. But Barbara also really plowed the field of women in science because in 2013, she was appointed as the first female director of one of the Austrian Academy of Sciences Institutes, and there are 28 of them. So with these words, um, Barbara, it is a great honor to welcome you here at the Field Museum today. And I hope for a round of applause to welcome you to the stage and present your talk on multi-species neolithization between West Asia and Europe, introdu introducing a new approach. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sabina, for this very super nice introduction. Um, I feel very, you know, honored now to uh, and to speak to you and to have the chance um, uh, to introduce myself and my research and also to to speak you know within this uh, women in science month program um, I would also like to thank Bill um, I hope that you know our uh, brilliant Sabina and your collaboration and your hosting of Sabina will be the starting point of a hopefully long-term uh, fruitful collaboration between Austria and Chicago. Um, and for sure, thanks to Amanda for making this all uh, uh, happening at the end. Um, it was not so easy to organize uh, everything in the background. All right, so um, yes, uh, I will use this opportunity to to talk a bit about my most recent research, some aspects of my most recent research, um, which is uh, 
a new approach I call uh, multi-species mobility. And after a quick in introduction um, and some, let's say, conceptual and terminological uh, clarification, uh, I will give you an overview of the topic. What do we understand when we talk about neoliberalization nowadays uh, in Asia and in Europe? Uh, and I will present some data facts and models uh, how I understand that and present a case study too. So it's all based on some recent field work. And I will, um, in the last, let's say, one third of my talk, um, I was asked to give my, well, let's say, advices or my ideas or my strategies how to deal with uh, women in science these days. And this was, I think, the most difficult part for me to prepare, to be honest. But, um, well, uh, let's see the last 10, 15 minutes, I will talk about this. So, so let's then start immediately. So what is the process of neolithization and what defines the process overall? Well, I think it's known here, you know, we are in, this, in the famous Chicago Field Museum, and I'm pretty sure you're all aware of what the Neolithic is at the end, but it is the one of the most important uh, crucial transformations um, our species had. Um, so we talk about the transformation from mobile hunter-gatherers to sedentary farmers uh, from the Mesolithic or Epipaleolithic period uh, into the new Neolithic way of life. So this crucial change um, in human history uh, uh, between, you know, West Asia, Southwest Asia and Europe started already 14 and 12,000 years ago. So, so within this time range and is still the oldest, the oldest part in the world where we have the evidence for this. So that's why it's still very exciting to work in that area. Um, well, it's about the new economy. Um, uh, based on farming and livestock, so new subsistence uh, strategies. It's a new sedentary lifestyle. Um, um, first household societies can be can be traced, and this is a topic that Sabina is following in in her in her current studies, uh, as well as the first villages in the world are evident uh, uh, within this uh, transformation into sedentary life um, into the into sedentary societies. So, but related with that is um, the evidence for a new connectivity and new exchange networks, not only between humans, but also between humans and animals and human animals and plants. And this is a point I will uh, come back a bit later when it comes to multi-species mobility. So I'm, I somehow leave a bit uh, this human-centric um, view aside today. And, um, uh, last but but uh, but not least, technologies and innovations uh, form a crucial part in this transformation process that we call neolithization. And this is all leading at the end to new material culture, what is then shaping our societies um, in West Asia and Europe, at least until today. Well, um, it all began in in what we know and what we summarize at the fertile crescent. You are aware of this. We're talking about Upper Mesopotamia, Levant, and Anatolia. And you know this famous, super famous site of Gopekli Tepe. We just had it today uh, in our discussion in the morning. So Gopekli Tepe is well known uh, for its monumental structures, its ritual structures, its monumental tea pillars with this unbelievable and unique um, symbolism that is depicted on these deep pillars. And this was raised already 11,500 to 11,000 years ago. Um, and this is the beginning, let's say the beginning of the Neolithic in the entire area. And this is one site of many other new sites. So Gerbergli is not unique anymore. There are many more, but I will not go into any details here. Um, however, the most recent excavations by our Turkish and German scholars recovered next to these very famous ritual monumental structures, also the remains of settlements. And these settlements of the pre-pottery Neolithic A period are also going back to 9,500 to 9,000 calibrated BC. So there, so there was already a sedentary or half sedentary community around, 
but they base their subsistence not on hunter, uh, not on domesticate and uh, cultivated plants, but on hunting and gathering and foraging. So this is exactly on the transformation phase between a 100% uh, mobile lifestyle into a sedentary community. So, and then it continues when we follow the route of the dispersal of the Neolithic further to the, to the west. This is a site called Aschaklerhög in central Anatolia. Again, a very important, very famous site in that area. And on the left side, you can see um, the very earliest remains, again, with some circular structures going back to the ninth millennium, um, the first sedentary communities there. You can see some reconstruction underneath. And on the right side, how this first settlement developed into this densely settled huge village um, in the eighth millennium. So in the early phases, uh, uh, they were just, let's say, started with some herding management of the first goats, um, and this then developed into a fully uh, domesticated and you know cultivated plants, um, plant, cult plant cultivation uh, farming society in the eighth millennium. So this is all well known. These are the facts uh, we are all aware of, and they and they are embedded in a um, in the into the dispersal of the Neolithic out of the Fertile Crescent to the west and to the northwest. And my contribution now is focusing uh, on this particular expansion of the new Neolithic way of life into Europe, and this is all based on on our own fieldwork data. So um, our fieldwork is marked here in, in, in our distribution map with these red stars. You can see one, you know, one example in the core zone. This is in, uh, in the Sagros Mountains in Western Iran. Um, one at the Aegean coast of Turkey, uh, a site I will show you in a minute. And a new uh, fieldwork project is in the, um, uh, in the heart of Southeastern Europe. And the dates here in this distribution map mark the earliest evidence of, ar of agriculture and farming in these particular regions in calibrated BC. Yeah. So, and these dates only mark the beginning uh, of a for sure very long-term process. So, which we then summarize as neolithization process. And this is also including a lot of adaptation and modification. Yeah, so it's not the same everywhere. Um, but what I would like to stress here is um, after, you know, about 120 years of research uh, on this topic, uh, most of our, um, let's say the majority in our community agrees that active movement of people actually played the crucial role for this dispersal of the Neolithic from Southwest Asia and the, out of the fertile question into the European continent. But I have to say that it also challenges us with some, let's say, big gaps and some open questions that we cannot answer yet when we zoom in into more details on a regional scale. So this is something we are all working on, or many teams are working on in this in these different areas. And this is just to give you some illustration of our different projects in Iran, Turkey, and Serbia. They are all embedded in different environments. And this is for sure a crucial aspect too, to understand the landscape because the different landscapes and the different environments on the routes of the uh, farmers um, on, on their way to Europe for sure played an important role and had a crucial impact on how these societies developed farming in these particular areas. So maritime communities, for example, um, are only partially comparable with uh, inland farmers and herders. Um, and I would say after our research, uh, decades long research on the Aegean coast of Turkey, and you can see sites marked at the coast here in Western Turkey on the right side. So after our research there, I would definitely stress the point that, um, that these maritime societies were much more flexible when it comes to nutrition, using of resources, um, communication, traveling routes, etc. So at least the sites we have uh, studied, and this is the site at the left side, Chukurichi Hoek, um, at least this site and let's say the communities at, at this site um, used both 
Yeah, there were on the one hand inland herders and farmers, but they were on the other hand also uh, maritime travelers for centuries long, uh, millennia long. Well, um, we have excavated um, the site, Chukurichi, for several years between 2007 and 14, um, and it's a multi layered tell settlement. You can see the several layers, settlement layers in this schematic uh, cross section here. Um, and it goes back already to the early 7th millennium BC, and this was quite surprising for all of us, because actually we were looking for something different in the beginning. But however, it turned out it is as early uh, as um, it is now summarized here, and as we have published it already, based on a sequence of radiocarbon data. And this makes it to the one of the earliest sites in Western Turkey, and if not there, but for sure, one of the earliest farming pioneers in the entire Mediterranean and the Aegean. So Chukorichi is a pioneer site, and as I had the chance to see this fantastic exhibition in this uh, great museum yesterday, I thought to integrate something here for maybe if there are uh, geologists in the audience today. Well, because we have also identified, well, there's so far um, earliest jade axes uh, going back again to the 7th millennium. You can see them on the right side, so they're all excavated at Chukorichi stone polished stone axes and they're definitely made out of jade jadeite and this jadeite which is not yet mapped on your fantastic uh, map distribution map in your exhibition the thanks to several colleagues um, they identified a new source a new jade source in the Mediterranean um, in concrete on the island of Syros I think I don't have a pointer here, but uh, it's the island of Syros in the in the center of the Cyclades. This is um, in this early days, in the seventh and sixth and fifth millennia, not settled. The islands are not settled, but nevertheless, the uh, the source for jaded was procured and exploited. So people came there and exchanged jadeite around, obviously the Aegean, and Chukurichi Hug is one of the earliest examples we have. So when it comes to the neolithization, um, we can analyze the different components. Yeah? So we have different components pointing to this um, um, general um, uh, transformative aspects I have explained in, the, uh, in my introduction. So settlement is pointing to sedentary societies, uh, subsistence to a new economy, um, um, raw materials to exchange systems, and um, other lithic tools and uh, uh, production um, uh, details are showing us new technologies and innovation. So however, when we want to analyze the components that we also call the Neolithic package, uh, when we want to study these components, um, it, we can figure out what is transformed, what is adopted and what was changed and what was lost on the way of the Neolithic pioneers between Asia and Europe. And I have to say, you can see Chukurichi Mark, this is a table we have published years ago. Many of the uh, core zone components reached the Aegean and reached the Western coast of Anatolia and Turkey, but are then lost on their way to the Danube, uh, to the Danube corridor, and are for sure lost when you follow these lines up to Scandinavia, yeah. So, but overall, let's say, uh, the results of our research in that uh, particular zone, uh, in my view, are you know are leading to a model that the spreading of the Neolithic is related with the movement of people. So people migrated on a small scale um, from Mesopotamia and the Levant, in particular, along the coast via maritime routes, and they came from the core zone. So this. This shiny orange fish is representing the Chukorichi people, and they, you know, they they came from another area and brought all their knowledge and all these aspects of this Neolithic way of life with them. So, practices, technologies, social strategies, household societies. So the entire package came with them, but not only the social strategies, but also much more, like the animals and the plants to continue. So coming back to the question of the dispersion of the Neolithic, so how this all could happen 9,000 years ago, 
or about nine nine thousand years ago. Um, it's clear that the expansion of farmers and herders from Asia to Europe was initiated by active movement. So the discussion about diffusion, I think it's over, thanks to the many new bioarchaeological data now, I think we really could solve this uh, long-term debate in archaeology, anthropology, and demography. Um, thanks to uh, the, let's say, genetic studies, I will not bother you with any details here, but these genetic studies made very clear that people with Anatolian genomes moved into Europe. And we can trace the evidence of these genetically related people very clearly, at least for the early Neolithic. But as I said in my intro, this mobility goes beyond humans in my view and represents a much wider and let's say inclusive phenomenon. So, and if we combine also other data from various other disciplines and try a more, let's say, holistic approach here, um, I would say we should talk about not only humans uh, or only human-centric um, approach here, but more about on multi-species mobility. And our knowledge about this multi-species mobility is growing with every new genetic and isotope analysis. Um, which makes the field a bit, you know, difficult to oversee and to follow up all this uh, most recent research. But it's quite clear now, based on these scientific data, that there are strong interconnections among West Asian and European humans, livestock, crops, pulses, as well as bacteria and diseases. And just as an example, I brought this, this study of Kuchet Ali uh, with me, the example about uh, on the house mouse, uh, which is most likely accompanying the pioneer farmers, the first Neolithic farmers from West Asia into Europe. Um, and this can be, um, uh, and, yeah, and there, is, there are also many other examples. Recent bioarchaeological data indicate the associated emergence uh, and spread of human adapted bacterial pathogens and viruses, such as the Salmonella enteric or the Yersinia pestis, to mention only a few, during this cultural transformation and this uh, uh, expansion process. So, and applying this now wider holistic perspective in archaeology uh, and in fieldwork. I would suggest this model now for multi, of multi-species mobility in relation with communication clusters. I have, you know, they are now mentioned in this, uh, in this colorful bubbles, communication clusters and new networks, material procurement and new niche economies that uh, developed with the Neolithic expansion. Uh, seasonally based subsistence and pastoralism are for sure strongly related with mobility of the herders and the flocks. Um, and this all is offering, let's say, a, a solid framework uh, to study the transformation in Europe uh, from um, mobile hunter-gatherers into farming sedentary communities and into this new Neolithic way of life. And this leads me now to uh, the new data uh, of new fieldwork uh, from our case study in Southeast Europe and in Serbia in particular. So when we were looking for new Neolithic sites that we could study, we followed one of the main corridors, the river corridors between the Danube and the Mediterranean, which is here marked, this is the so-called Varda Morava uh, river corridors. Um, and we started with our service in the first open basin. It's depicted uh, at the right side, the first open basis, uh, basin after this environmental frontier. There is an environmental frontier, you know, in the more southern part, marked also at the left side. We have a very strong Mediterranean climate, Mediterranean landscape, whereas north of it, we talk about continental European climate uh, and um, environment. So well, we started our work there in 2017, and we are able to identify several sites, and decided to start to work in you know excavate one site. It's called Svinjerich Kachuka. We named it Svinjerich Kachuka, um, and 
Well, we focus on the development of this uh, Neolithic um, communities there from a microecological level, you know, a local site level to a much broader environmental and ecological context. So this is a bit, again, how we do our case studies. Um, and this is what we do now uh, also on the Balkans. So the site you can see this is uh, located in a beautiful landscape, a very fruitful landscape uh, also today. It's not densely settled at all. Um, and um, it's uh, upon a very you know, flat river terrace within this hilly resource rich landscape. And it's very close to this Morava river corridor. So it's very close to this one of these main communication routes between the Aegean and, um, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Danube. So yeah, you have here some uh, impressions from, uh, from our site work. Um, the environmental conditions um, were very suitable for agriculture. So this is already clear, thanks to geoarchaeological botanical um, investigations. We talk about very fertile soils, fresh water sources in the direct surrounding, and the temperate climate around 8,000 years ago. Wood and clay was available in the vicinity according to the new charcoal dates. So they are depicted on the, on the, on, on the right side. And uh, thanks to the material studies, we can also say that there are a lot of uh, lithic resources in the direct vicinity and in the surroundings. Well, and the geophysical results, you know, after we did all the surveys, the geophysical results indicated already a very complex and multi-leveled occupation of this river terrace. And we uh, then could start to investigate with several trenches, I will show them. And it's clear that we talk about domestic features, domestic, um, um, uh, even houses and buildings going back to the very early Neolithic. And I have to say, I would like to point out that we are talking about a very interesting variety of the built environment, something that we don't know from Southwest Asia. Uh, very different strategies of how to build the houses, um, different kind of dwellings. And again, I don't go into any details here, so don't worry. Um, I just want to mention here three of the six occupation levels, uh, all dated, you know, within a very good and clear solid radio uh, carbon sequence here. And it's clear that we talk about different concepts of living already at this site and the different occupation level. Yeah, and this is one example. This is, uh, these are the remains of a large, let's say large domestic, huge house with several renewed floors. So it was used obviously for a longer time, for a longer period. And just for the experts here in the audience, this is clearly Stachevo. Yeah, this is a clearly Stachevo cultural horizon. Uh, it's a huge building. Um, and with abandoned materials, yeah, hundreds and thousands of artifacts we have excavated there, also fantastic stuff, also ornaments, figurines, etc. But however, a lot of these artifacts are pointing to a clear household activities that took place in the house and outside the building, like textile production, stone tool production, food preparation, etc. And the story is a bit different when we come to the uh, most youngest occupation level. So this is just, these are the remains of a very light hut, small area, um, and the micromorphological analysis um, could prove that there is a lot of anthropogenic activity going on, but there are no renewed floors or something like this. So we think of a much more temporarily used area. So a hut, that was used, you know, from time to time, perhaps people came and went away. And what you can also see at the right side uh, down there is the installation of a grinding stone and for grinding facility for producing uh, food. So food preparation was a big topic. And um, thanks to the new studies of Laura Dietrich, um, a postdoc uh, of our group, uh, she worked with us for a while and I'm quite thankful to her. You can, you can see Laura standing uh, between the thousands of grinding stones at Göppegli Teppe. So she's an expert on this particular um, 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 
grinding and mortar uh, facilities. And she came also to Serbia and studied these materials. And she could prove that they were used heavily um, for uh, producing wheat and pulses. And in our particular case of this hut I have presented you before, they produced also peas. So early pulses at the very early stage uh, of the early Neolithic farmers, pioneers uh, in the central Balkans. Well, and moreover, with the starch and phytolit analysis, this is also uh, additionally supported by the macro botanical remains. But however, she could also prove that the particular toolkits the guys used at the central Balkans can be related with the origins in Southwest Asia. So they're using exactly the same type of grinding stones, mortars, and pestles like they did uh, um, in the core zone. And this is quite exciting um, and shows us again a mobility and a movement of people and knowledge transfer. And let me also say the frequent mobility over long distances is also proven by the procurement strategies Holistic raw materials. Um, so these Neolithic communities uh, heavily used obsidian and chertz and so on from different areas and different sources. These are studies by Michael Brandl and Bogdana Milic. Uh, both are working on uh, in both areas in Asia and uh, in Southeast Europe. So we assume after their studies, um, communication clusters and specialists for mining, exploiting, transporting, and exchanging the stones and minerals in the wider area. So again, you see a lot of mobility is included here. And the pilot study on microarchaeology we have started several years ago. Yeah, we wanted to try something. So if pathogens are evident and so on, but uh, but within yeah, or let's say one of the main results of this pilot study. Uh, could also, or is leading to the assumption that we have to think of a variety of different mobilities here. Irregular temporary sedentism, regular semi-mobile people, as well as full sedentary society. All at the same time, uh, how, um, is, how it is evident at the site we've excavated there. And thanks to the new project of Lindell Webster, another fantastic postdoc in our team, um, she could, you know, working, she's working on micromorphology there, and she could identify several things um, which let her suggest um, a strong human animal interaction here. We're talking about coprolites and dung, using of dung at the site, and the spaces were not kept clean, neither inside nor outside the buildings. And this is for sure, again, you know, pointing to a cohabitation of animals and humans, and for sure the, let's say, the race of potential diseases. So the entire package of domesticated animals and cultivated plants is evidence at the site. So the pioneers brought everything already with them. And the intensification of human-animal interaction in the daily life of the early farming communities um, in our case study is supporting the appearance of zoonoses and diseases. Although I have to admit, it was not possible yet to trace the evidence of pathogens in, in, in the sediments, but we are working on that for sure. The seasonal pastoralism is pointing to a regular seasonal mobility of both together, the flock, and the herders. And overall, animals, plants, and bacteria moved within the Neolithic expansion and, most likely, also during the centuries after the pioneers. So we talk about a perhaps millennium-long process, um, including this uh, particular multi-species mobility. So to sum up the scientific part uh, of my talk, um, I'm very convinced that mobility offers a key for our understanding um, of the Neolithic expansion from Southwest Asia into the European continent. And it, and it can definitely shed some new light on its very complex process. Which brings me to another topic, but let me just uh, finish that uh, before. If some of you is interested in any of you know, these aspects, all the publications are um, 
um, available via our online repositories. You can find all the papers and books there as well um, via our web pages and YouTube uh, channel, etc. You can find several movies, 3D animations, etc. visualizations where we try to 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 bring these stories, these very complex archaeological stories, um, into let's say a more easier narrative at the end. And last, but for sure not least, I would like to mention, it's my pleasure to mention all these great people I have the pleasure to work with. So this is my group in Vienna um, with all these brilliant um, students and PhD students and postdocs. Um, and one of them is, uh, uh, is Sabina. And we hope um, to can, yeah, we hope at the end to welcome her back in two years when her project here is over which leads me now to the final, let's say 10, 12 minutes of my talk, um, which should be dedicated to uh, women's history, or let's say what women in science are facing these days and what could be, you know, a potential strategy to deal with, well, what we're all facing in our realities. So, as I said, this was a bit challenging for me to prepare this, so, um, um, I thought I should start after your super nice introduction, Sabina. I don't have to mention any details here of my of my personal CV. I just want to say that what I have, you know, experienced as good and bad things in about twenty five, almost thirty years in academia now, and there are some good and for sure not so good experiences, but they build the fundament for what for all the things I would like to follow up then in my next slides. So. I have to admit, I had some fantastic supportive male supervisors in different countries during all the years in my studies. And I think it was quite helpful to do my studies in different universities in different countries with different languages and you know, in different cultural backgrounds somehow. Although I have to say, um, uh, although this is going back to the 1990s and early 2000s, um, all these academic university institutions were and are still very traditional. So there is no progressive movement as until today, which is leading to a strong bias in many aspects, um, not only for the old generation, also for the new generation, also with the new generation. Well, for me personally, there was definitely a lack of any kind of mentoring programs or fellowships or information on fellowships. So this was absolutely not the case. So we didn't um, get any information on that. Um, I would like to say something positive. Um, at the end, it was the excellent funding situation, the opportunity to, to propose for external funding, highly competitive funding um, by the Austrian Science Fund, as well as by the European Research um, uh, Committee, both allowed me to build up my own thing and to do my own research and my own fields of research, which was, you know, these kind of things that I'm following in my, in my archaeological, let's say, trajectory, was not done in Austria before. So prehistory in Anatolia or in Iran or um, um, in, um, scientific interdisciplinary work was definitely not uh, on the table in Austria in the last 150 years. Um, so these funding um, institutions institutions offered me the opportunity to build up my own group. And this is then, you know, was then very easy, not very easy, but at the end I could build up the group. And this, this, um, this allowed me to do all these things that happened afterwards. So this is the fundament, um, which I, which is, you know, shaping my experiences and my personal background. And Sabina mentioned that I was the first and only female director in a very traditional uh, research institution at the Academy of Sciences. And you can imagine how that was in the beginning um, and pas yeah, partially still is. Um, but this is also, this also forced me at least to, um, to think of how to change the system. <laughs> Yeah, so to, to a kind of a wake up call. So I think there is a need for change still. Um, and this is going back to my personal experiences. And I would like to suggest three different levels here. So uh, what 
I can do? What can I do? Let's phrase it as a question. What can I do? What can we all do to change something? And what should institutions and organizations do? Um, so I have three more slides and then I'm done. Um, so what can I do? I think be active. This is the most important thing after, you know, following after my experience, uh, participate in uh, mentoring programs when this is possible. Otherwise, look for mentoring programs and look for a mentor, either female or male, it doesn't matter, should be just supportive, <laughs> supportive and smart. Um, yeah, searching for the best fitting supervisor. It's not automatically the best scientist. Uh, but perhaps the most supportive one would be a good, clever idea. I'm not so sure about role models. After all, after these 25 years, I don't know how helpful role models are for us at the end. Well, um, for sure it would be good if we would have more, but when they're not existing and they're not evident, at least in prehistoric archaeology, this is the case in Europe. Uh, there are not many out there. Um, successful, let's say, female prehistorians in leading roles, leading institutions, and, you know, having families, kids, and so on. So I, I'm not aware of many out there. Uh, but even without a role model, um, I think it's important to follow your own scientific path. Uh, follow your own questions, follow your own, your own topic, because this is your topic, your research, your aims, your choice. Um, so this is what I always um, teach or tell also in these mentoring programs and in the, even in the undergraduate classes. I think choose your topic wisely because you have to live with the topic for a while. Um, and at, yeah, and what is also important um, is at the end, accepting that rejections are part of the game. Um, because I see and watch, unfortunately, many, many uh, fantastic, brilliant, talented uh, female postdocs leaving leaving academia after being rejected from time to time or several times. But this is part of the game. Don't give up. Go on. Um, at one point, you will be successful. What can we do? I mean, we all. Yeah. Um, I think what we should do is we should support female scientists on all levels because there are still not enough in the leading positions yet. And this is including that we have to work against bias on all levels, including, and I also mean myself here, yeah? We're all biased when, we're, when we are working in committees and panels, when we are given particular topics or helping to find topics for PhD students. So we are very biased. Um, let me give an example. We just discussed this two days ago. Um, I can talk for archaeology. In archaeology, the good, big topics are usually studied by male researchers. The down of everything. To mention only one. Yeah? The big stories, the big narratives. Whereas the very important other topics, but they are not sexy and they are not you know, selling points, like you know, material studies, pottery chronologies, all these... Um, um, all this very important, crucial, fundamental work is very often done by the female PhD students. So we as supervisors should also think of how we how we give you know particular topics to particular people, and also the students should think of um, what would be a right topic um, to follow a career at the end or to have a career at the chance of uh, of a career. So there are biased topics, there are biased panels. And there is for sure a biased recruiting system we're all part of. We're all part of the game. Um, I think it's also very important to create a welcoming working atmosphere. So I very I like very much this anti-toxic, you know, movement at the moment. Although I know also from my own from my own experience, it's very difficult to make this. Uh, it's it can be a super challenge and it's it's not always a positive experience, but at the end, I think it, it is helpful. And for sure to build networks face-to-face -face and also social media networks. And especially the social media networks can help, you know, when we all work together, um, help to raise the visibility of young female students, yeah, of young scholars 
um, and to make them known in the wider public. And I'm coming now to my last slides, um, which perhaps is the most important one. So what should, could institutions, and this means now politics, do? And this is something I'm struggling with since um, a while. And um, uh, I'm, as I'm very engaged in changing something or trying to change something, I think organizations can do dedicated events, for example. Bravo to the Field Museum um, to make this Women um, Women Science Month and to have even in your shop, uh, I saw it yesterday, a corner in your museum shop, a corner where you promote uh, women in science and people can, you know, um, can buy stuff there. Um, well, I think the raising, you know, raising the visibility of female scientists is something that can easily be done by organizations and institutions. This is not a big thing and it doesn't cost very much. Um, but there's, there are also things that are including finances, like to sponsor dedicated grants and fellowships. Um, this is something including money and this should be, in my view, should be done, much more done uh, by the organizations and the institutions implementing better flat, flexible working hours. This is a big topic, at least in Europe and in Austria, how we can change our working hours, the, uh, the office system uh, for, you know, women, child caring and uh, kindergarten, etc. So this is all, this is all a topic. And I think we, we have, we have to focus on that much more. We have to change the recruiting system in academia. I'm very convinced of this, but this is also very difficult and a tricky, slippery field. Um, because at the end, we have to hire more female scientists in leading positions. Um, without females, you know, without women in leading positions, it will not change. I don't say that everything is going super better and we would live in paradise afterwards, for sure not. But at least the awareness for, for particular um, challenges and obstacles would be would be there. Um, so, and to change that, it's important to recreate committees and panels and our working committees and panels. There is a kind of dynamic in this panel system. You know, many of you know that and how these dynamics work. And it's very difficult as individuals to to fight against this, you know, typical panel work progress or how it is done these days. But I think this is also a crucial point. Well, and let me conclude. Um, I think there's still a lot to do in my view and for all of us, but change is possible. So, so let's uh, conclude it with some positive optimistic perspective here. And I am optimistic that I, I will experience uh, further steps of development and more leading women in science uh, roles uh, in my active career time. I would, yeah. So let's, let's conclude this with this positive perspective at the end. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Barbara, for your words. Uh, that's gonna be the audience for the next question. Thank you. So I'd like to ask whether there are any questions in the audience. Yeah. All right. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so you study the westward movement of domesticated animals and plants. I assume there is an eastward and southward movement also um, that somebody else is studying. And also in the Americas, that all the domestication of crops kind of came up independently, I assume, right? So anyway, I'm just, just curious if that was all true. And But you're not studying that, I guess, so. Um. Well, no, unfortunately, but I'm very aware of what's um, um, for sure that we have this different, like, we call it, you know, these core zones of the, uh, these different various core zones in different world areas, uh, like also in China, for example, when it comes to rice or uh, in Southwest Africa or for sure in the, in the, uh, in the Americas. But 
actually I can't tell you the roots of or um, the further dispersal uh, for the uh, for the Americas, I'm afraid. But I can tell you that where when we have the westward and northwestward expansion out of the fertile question, this is this is so we have good good data for that. But when it comes to the other directions. Oh my God, um, this is really a tricky field and we are lacking um, data for the north and for the south and for sure for the east. So the east is still a kind of a miracle for us. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, I feel like a child, but I wanted to ask about the copper lights um, and whether you were mentioning that, you know, there is a, a lot of indication through these different copper lights that yeah. there's cohabitation between uh, animals and humans, um, but there had not yet been um, pathogenic studies done. Is that is that accurate? And is that, if that is true, will there be more studies or are there ongoing studies into some of these interactions and, and the pathogens that are spreading between animals? And humans? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question. Well, actually, this is a study we started three years ago, um, and we would, you know, we are still searching for preserved pathogens in the sediments. And this is this is really this is, I would say, also in the what we call environmental DNA studies at the moment, the biggest obstacle. What uh, the geneticists are constantly working on new methods of extracting pathogens out of the sediments, and at the moment. You know, you find billions of DNA data, yeah, um, and none of them can be really uh, related with this particular, you know, time horizon or let's say species, yeah. So that's why we were not successful so far, but we continue that, and um, I've I've tried to work with different labs. I have to say, so we are trying different labs and. At the end, I hope we find the early zoonosis there. I would really expect this, but yeah, we don't have the evidence yet, unfortunately. Thanks, and we have actually a good follow-up question to from one of the online attendees who is asking, you mentioned the tracing origins of pathogens in ancient DNA is not yet completely possible, but what do you hope that this type of analysis would reveal in the work you are doing? Huh. Ah, again, an excellent question. Thank you very much. You know, when it comes to genes, you are always surprised, you know, as a, as a, as a non-genetist, I have to say, as an archaeologist, they're always producing data I have not expected before. So what I, what I expect with our working hypothesis is that we can identify particular potential diseases diseases that are related with this new way of life, this new lifestyle of living together, you know, with the, with the flocks in, in these new household societies that include not only human, but also animals. Um, so, and that these diseases are changing also, um, you know, many, many aspects of life. So this is, this is one aspect, what I um, expect to find out with the help of the DNA. And the other aspect is, um, are the surprises, you know, when you try new methods uh, with, you know, this uh, fancy DNA stuff, you will never know what is the outcome. So, yes, um, I hope for some surprises too. Good question, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, okay. That was great, Barbara. Thank you. It was exactly what I think we were hoping for you to do here. So it was really wonderful. Um, I really appreciate the discussion of mobility in the Neolithic and interspecies or multi-species mobility, especially in a in a non-flaky way, because people have talked about this kind of thing and it's kind of gotten flaky before. And so I really like the the very substantive way that you talk about it. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this issue of migration and people movement, because, um, you know, as you know very well, when once you get to the Aegean, things get really complicated, right? Uh, in terms of dates, in terms of material culture, um, like, did people forget to make pottery? What What's going on there, right? 
Like, did they just forget? Oh yeah, we don't do that anymore. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering in a, in a broader sense, how you envision mobility happening, especially in places where there, you've already got dense populations, right? Dense, pretty much sedentary Mesolithic populations. So I'm just curious if you could unpack that a little bit more for us in terms of how you actually see it playing out. Mm. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for this question, which is not so easy to answer, I have to say. Well, um, yes, okay, I worked a lot on this topic, you know, related with our Chukovici excavations and all this, as you said, this difficult data in the Aegean. Um, so first of all, uh, let's fix that. So there is, I think, the chronology for the pioneers, the pioneers that came as a first generation farmers into the Aegean is clear something, let's say early seventh millennium, 6,800 calibrated BC is more or less. So this is, this is, this is the date we should expect. And there are just very few sites really going back to this early pioneer phase. So most of the sites we know in the Aegean are actually slightly later. So we don't have the first generations in all of these famous sites you have in mind here. Um, this, this is all much later, 200, 300, 400 years later even. So this is one aspect. The second aspect is I think we, at least for the, for the sites we have analyzed and studied, is it's quite clear that we talk about small scale movement. Small groups of pioneers came, but they brought that all with them, including the animals. And for example, to give you a very clear example for this, you have to, to talk about some scientific evidence here. The first domestic pigs we know are from Chukurichi, going back to this very early phase, 6,800, 6,700 calibrated BC. And pigs, domesticated pigs, are not at all uh, coming from inland Anatolia. There are no peaks in Chatal in these early phases. Yeah, Chatal Hulk is peaks are, are much later. The same is true for all the other sites we know. So it's clear that they had to come via the maritime route from the let's say upper 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 Levant, northern Levant, upper Mesopotamia. These are the there are this is the place where the domesticated peaks came from. So via the maritime route. So I think really of people pioneers coming in boats with the peaks having the pigs with them. So uh, when you visualize these journeys, yeah, this must have been crazy. Yeah? Animals, kids, all the stuff, and they took it with them. Otherwise, we cannot explain it fully, fully and you know, fully packaged for this Neolithic lifestyle in these early pioneer sites. So this is just one example. And the same is when it comes to the contact with the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers in the Aegean, as you said. You're right. I agree that there's this is densely already populated. People were around. They were sailing around. They were not sailing. They are traveling, maritime traveling, and they knew all the sources. They knew, you know, how to get fresh water when you travel through uh, through the deep sea and so on. So they had to communicate with each other. But the Mesolithic hunter gatherers and the you know the coming, you know, the in, let's say the incoming pioneers, for sure, they spoke different languages very different languages and they for sure they looked very different and had different practices and so on. But they managed in a way which is think, I think very impressive still until today, they managed to communicate with each other and to share knowledge because this is evident too. We see this in many, many details. I cannot explain here now, but uh, we see that there is a communication and the shared knowledge, the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers and the incoming pioneers. This would be, I think, impossible today when we think of the same route today and the Aegean today and migration there today. So this uh, would not be possible these days, but it was possible in the early Holocene. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So one final question, because I don't want to keep everyone for too long, but yeah. Um, this, this kind of follows on your talking about the mobility and movement and movement with these entire kind of packages. I was really interested in the site in Serbia where you were, I think it was mm -hmm. Serbia, sorry, where you found the um, grinding stones that yeah. were basically identical to those found further to the east. And is that something that they're bringing with them? And I wonder, like, can you, have you been able to trace those, those sources back to where those are coming from or is it local? And kind of that, does that speak to their 
previous knowledge or understanding of what that landscape was like, because you had mentioned it was very different from yeah. th these three different landscapes were very different. So they're not necessarily knowing what they're walking into, what kind of resources are on the landscape. So, and what's happening around the, the grinding stones, which would have been a really primary tool at that time, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you um, for this for this really cool question. Again, not so easy to answer, but I, I will do my best to make it very short. Um, well, the grinding stones are from that, let's say, techno typology and their shapes are related with the origins uh, in the in the core zone of the fertile question. But the sources are local. So, so they produced out of the local uh, stone sources this very, very particular shapes and types. And what uh, what we interpret is that there's the you know that they brought the knowledge with them, the knowledge about this how to produce this grinding thingy um, instead of the stone itself. So this the, so so the stones were all procured in the local wider and more closer areas, and this is again pointing to an interaction with the Mesolithic hunter gatherers because who knew where all the sources were. And we're talking also about many different church sources, yeah, and obsidian sources and um, um, particular granite sources. And so all these kind of sources you need for a super, let's say, stone age community. And I think the knowledge about all that was transferred and communicated by the Mesolithic hunter gatherers to the incoming farmers. Otherwise, it would have, I, th I think it would have taken much too long um, to, to find all the sources by themselves. I think that, again, we have indirectly the evidence for this communication. Thank you very much. I think that's a nice uh, point to also end our discussions of sharing knowledge and co yeah, being good in communication, both between advisors, students uh, across disciplines. So thank you so much for coming out today, attending today's talk. Thanks, Barbara, for this well-rounded uh, lecture on pushing the understanding of neolithization, but also how to support women in science and being quite optimistic about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>